If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Leviticus? I don't go there too often, but Leviticus, the 26th chapter. We've been talking the last two weeks about uh, Proverbs 10, 9. He who walks in integrity will walk securely. We're talking about how important it is that we uh, do walk securely, which means a, a sense of feeling secure, but also actually being secure. And to be secure, one must be overcoming their enemies. Uh, if you feel like your enemies are going to overcome you, you're not going to walk secure. When I was in uh, Baguio this year, they were telling me about how the neighbors have been stealing from them, and they're, they're, they're a little higher up on the mountain, so they're watching every move that we made. And they had broken into this uh, to the Bible school twice, and, and uh, you know, one was during the typhoon when the pyro was out and the rain was coming down, so that they actually took a bolt cutter and started cutting the metal windows open. And uh, it's a little scary, you know, when you got an enemy, just your neighbor, watching you the whole time. And, of course, when an American comes, they always know that usually with Americans comes stuff and uh, money. So uh, I, changed, I changed a few things. I was a little bit more careful than usual. But I still, you know, I, I got to admit, I just walked security because I, I believe I've got a living God. I believe he's called me. I believe that he's equipped me. I believe that he's got a destiny for me. And I just work very hard at renewing my mind to that. You know, without an eternal perspective, a person's perspective of the temporal is really twisted. If you don't see the bigger picture, you're going to start just looking at the temporal picture. And if you just look at the temporal picture, your life's going to be miserable. It really is. No matter how good it is, it's going to be miserable. Because no matter how good you got it, you're going to see somebody that doesn't have it as good. And uh, during the holiday season, this is a tough time for a lot of people. There's a lot of tough things happen during the holiday season. And, uh, but when you have an eternal perspective, realizing you're going to live forever, realizing that, you know, uh, um, you know, my mom passed away in August, and I know my mom lived out a full life. She didn't go home young. She was 88 years old. And people say, oh, I bet you're missing your mom. But, you know, I, I, I tell you, you know, it, it's, there's definitely a vacancy every time we get together. You know, there's that seat that mom's not filling. But boy, I don't know. I don't let my mind go to, oh my gosh, my mom's gone. I go, oh my gosh, my mom's home. What kind of fun is she having right now? What kind of, what kind of enlightenment is she having? And, you know, and uh, whether you're young or old, when you go home, you're still going to be home forever and ever. And, and what, a, what a hope that we have. And by having an eternal perspective, you can get the temporal one in the right perspective. Let's read this in Leviticus 26. It says, You shall not make for yourselves idols, nor shall you, this is verse 1, nor shall you set up for yourselves an image or a sacred pillar, nor shall you place a figure stone in your hand to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. Now, I just want to say, you know, most of the time when we read this, it doesn't relate to us because, you know, we don't put up idols or whatever else, but... Uh, God just said, and there should be no other gods. And I want to just come back to what I kind of said last week. Your God is wherever you are looking for provision from. You know, if whatever source that you're looking to for, for your life, that's a God to you. Uh, if you're, for your source of finances, for your source of, of uh, well-being, for your source of security, for your source of hope or for love or for, for excitement... It, Whatever you're looking to as a source, that is a God to you. And so your God can become a job, a position, an ability, a talent, because you're looking to it. And that's a false God, and it will always fail. Uh, and that's why even as Christians, we think, well, we don't have false gods. But no, a lot of us do because we're looking to something other than God for our source. You can be looking to your wife for your source of joy and happiness. I'm telling you, that's, that's a false god. And it won't work. Uh, you know, if you just go with the world's philosophy on relationships, you're gonna, it's disastrous. You know, I like romantic movies, but they're horrible as far as uh, truth. You know, they're just a, you know... Uh, I watch Peter Pan, too. So, uh, But, I, you know, I want to grow up. I don't want to be a child anymore. But whatever, any source in your life, other than God, is a false God. And we'll go on. You, you should keep the, the, my Sabbaths and, and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments so as to carry them out, 
Then I shall give you uh, rains in their season so that the land will yield its produce and its trees of the field and will bear fruit. Indeed, your threshing uh, will last for you until grape gathering, and grape gathering will last until sowing time. You will thus eat your food to the full and live securely in your land. I shall also grant peace in the land so that you may lay down with no one making you tremble. I will also eliminate harmful beasts from the land, and no sword will pass through your land. But you will chase your enemies, and they will fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall before you by the sword. We talked about our enemies, and last week we talked a lot about how our enemies are not people. Our enemies are not governments. Our enemies are not corporations. Uh, our, our, our enemies are those feelings inside of us that are twisted, that are dark, that are wrong. Feelings of insecurity, f- feelings of rejection. You know, as I minister uh, all over, but especially overseas, well, here too, but it really magnifies when I'm over there. One of the greatest enemies I find is fear of rejection, and that happened right in the garden. Adam and Eve thought they were rejected by God. The serpent got them convinced that uh, once they fell that they were rejected. You know, and, you know, Adam wasn't rejected by God. There were certain conditions that he failed in, but, you know, Adam didn't even try to go to God and say, can you restore me? Because of that fear of rejection. If you feel rejection from God, you're not going to run to God and say, restore me. You're going to run away. And the more you run away, the more you feel rejected, and the more you are rejected, so the more it confirms your belief, so you actually think this is really the truth, what it's all about, it's all a lie. God does not reject you. You know what I found? With my high uh, uh, personality, fear of rejection was my greatest fear. And so I would go overboard uh, to get people not to reject me. I'd be kind to people that I didn't want to be kind to. I'd be courteous to people I didn't even like. I, I would do things for people just so they wouldn't reject me. I'd just, you know, do anything. And that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? But it's like what Deb was shared a few weeks ago. Kindness isn't when you do something kind so you get something. Kindness is when you just are kind. And it wasn't like I was just kind because I was kind. It was because I was trying to satisfy a need in my life of not being rejected. So I worked harder than most. I'd show up earlier than most. I'd do things just so I wouldn't be rejected. Well, man, you come into the pastor, and you come in as a pastor, and all of a sudden you, you still, you know, you're still dealing with that enemy, and you can, you can become really twisted trying to make everybody happy and not be rejected by anybody. And so this is an ongoing fight that I have. And on this trip, the Lord really spoke to me. He just, uh, uh, you know, I had hours and hours of being alone on a plane with the Lord. And, and one thing he said, he said, son, I need you to cross the line. And, and he said, yeah, and I'll share that a little bit more later. Uh, let, let's go to another scripture first. Let's go to Luke, the first chapter. And this is kind of a Christmas one. This part is about as close to Christmas I'll get today. Luke 171. Zacharias is prophesying over John the Baptist. I mean, after, you know, he, you can read the story. He went mute because he didn't believe God. And then he could speak and, he, and begin to prophesy. And I'm just going to pick it up in the middle of it here. Uh, Luke 1, verse 71. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. To show mercy towards our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath which he swore to Abraham our father. To grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Zacharias was prophesying about Jesus coming and just what that was going to bring and just what it was all about. And one of those things was about was that we would be delivered from all our enemies, that we could serve God without fear. You know, that's a, I don't know about you, but that's huge. If you stop and think about it, what would it be like if you could serve out the rest of your days to God without fear? Absolutely just did not have any fear of anything. Fear of, fear of being rejected, fear of, 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 fear of loss of security. Fear of being taken advantage of. Fear of being criticized. Those are all major fears in most people's lives. And, and just think about it. If you could serve out the rest of your days here on earth and not fear what people are thinking about you, not fear that you're gonna, whether you're going to be taken care of financially or not, how huge would that be? Wouldn't that be something? You know, you know if you, here's the truth. If you could live without fear, you'd be living so much better. 
Your financial decisions would be better because a lot of your financial decision, decisions that have cost you is because you had fear in your life and you made a poor decision based on it. Fear is the number one thing, you know. Fear and all that is, is uh, stress, what they call stress, but it always comes back down to fear is a major reason you and I are not healthy. A lot of times because, you know, and I mean, I don't know about you, but you can wake up in the morning and just have a knot in your gut before the day ever starts about what the day is going to bring. Fear about even your, your relationship with your family, you know, just, you know, what tension is going to be there today, uh, or, you know, who's going to be irritated, or whatever. And then there's people that get into fear of just every moment that their, their life's going to be, you know, wiped out in a car wreck or disease or, you know, if you uh, uh, ever watch Monk, you know, there's people that just live in fear that uh, they got to step on the right crack or life's going to go wrong, you know. Uh, Wow, what an awesome thing. I, when I first read this years ago, I thought, man, I, I want to serve God without fear. And yet it's, it's an ongoing battle for me. I've got to keep renewing my mind. Let me read to you something from Spurgeon. He's an old uh, a, a preacher from way back. And uh, I just came across this a few days ago. And uh, I, just, I just thought it said it. It says it a little bit different than what we'd say. And he goes to Proverbs, uh, the 16th chapter, verse 33, and it says, the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. Well, I think that's King James, but it says, The lot is cast, and this is what they were, were casting lots, and they didn't usually use sticks like, you know, one short stick and three long ones. What they do is they put uh, uh, broken pottery in a pot, and they would shake it, and they would shake it out. And the way that the pieces came out would de- make the decision as casting of lots. But it says that even though you cast them out on your lap, it's that the Lord is the one that's going to make the decision. The Lord's going to make the direction. And so he has this little uh, devotional. He says, in the disposal of the lot, it, it, if the disposal of the lot is, in the, it, is the Lord's, whose is the arrangement of our, who is the arrangement of our whole life? Boy, I butchered that really bad. Let me start over. If the disposal of the lot is the Lord's, whose is the arrangement of our whole life? If the simple casting of a lot is guided by him, how much more the events of our entire life, especially when we are told by our blessed Savior, the very hairs on your head are all numbered, not a sparrow falleth to the ground without your father. It would bring a holy calm over your mind, dear friend, if you would always remember this. It would so relieve your mind of anxiety that you would be the better able to walk in patience, quiet, and cheerfulness as a Christian should. When a man is anxious, he cannot pray with faith. When he is troubled about the world, he cannot serve his master. His thoughts are self-serving himself. If you would see, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all things would be added unto you. You are meddling with Christ's business and neglecting your own when you fret about your lot and circumstances. You have been trying, providing work, and forgetting that it is yours to obey. Be wise and attend to obeying, whether he will let you starve while he has laid up so great an abundance in his garner. Look at his mer- heart of mercy. See if that can ever prove unkind. Look at his uns- inscrutable wisdom. See if that will ever be at fault. Above all, look up to Jesus Christ, your intercessor, and ask yourself, while he pleads, can your father deal ungraciously with you? If he remembers even the sparrows, will he forget one of the least of his poor children? Cast thy bread upon the Lord, and he will sustain thee. He will never suffer the, the righteous to be moved. What would it be like to absolutely live your life without fear because you know a living God. Because you just have an incredible trust in a living God. Your source. Your source for everything. Your source for joy. Your source for peace. Your source for fulfillment. You know, Peter Pan says, I don't want to grow up. But why? Why? Why not? Is dreaming easier than living? One of the things about this society that absolutely blows my mind is how many people are substituting 
so many wonderful things for their life. Here's what I'm trying to say. Today you can not only go to the movie theater and see a great movie, you can not only watch it in your home, you can put it on your cell phone, you can put it on your iPad, you can get so caught up in an almost fantasy world that you can live in a dreaming world almost all day long. And I'm, I'm not against those things. I really can't enjoy some of those things. But I'm telling you, it's how, how few people are actually living their life right now. They're, they're trying to get all their stimulus from all kinds of, of just being swallowed up into a dream world. You know, they can't hardly wait for the next one. And I think, you know, we weren't created just to watch somebody else's life until we died. We were created to live. We weren't created just to read somebody else's story all the time. We were created to write our own story. You know, even, even in ministry, I, I, I love to read about guys that have done heroic things, but only long enough just to get myself fired up to go outside to do it again. You know, I really, I really appreciate what I'm seeing Andrew, what's happened to Andrew with many other people, but it's like, that's great, that's encouraging, but what is our part? I don't want to covet his part. I don't want to say, oh, I wish I had his life. I want to say, no, my God has called me, and what he has said, my God is a good God. My God is absolutely concerned about it. My God never gives me second rate nothing. My God is set for me just perfect. You know, it's almost like coveting somebody else's wife or their money or their job or whatever. It's almost like the problem with that is when you covet somebody else's goodness, you forfeit yours. And by the way, your God is designed for you, the perfect life for you. He's not given, He has designed the absolute perfect life for you. It fits you perfectly. You are never second rate to God. He is, his mind is always, He can give His intense, total focus on you at one time. And I swear, when you're in that experience, when you're experiencing that intimacy with God, you almost think that there's nobody else that God loves like He loves you. And yet you know he does this simply because he's so huge. But he's loving you with all of his love. You feel all his love. You feel all his passion. There's a book in the back. It's like a, it says this one right here. It says, In Heaven by Dean uh, Braxton. You know, And he talks about going to heaven. He died on the operating table and he went to heaven. He says, Man, when you get before God's throne, he says, You feel the love of God. And it does. It feels exactly that way. It feels like God is just lavishing you with all of his love. Like you have 100% of all that he's got. Like you're the only one that really, really loves and cares for. You said you feel that, and yet you know that he's, he's doing that for everybody else. But he said it's so intimate. Man, that is so powerful. When God is your source in everything, you can feel so secure. You can feel so blessed. You can, you know, and all of a sudden, you don't want to forfeit that for somebody else's dream world. You get tired of just, you know, you're not trying to just, you know... Watch the NBA and dream about being one of those players. You realize your life is a dream. Your life is an awesome thing. And yet I guarantee you most people look at their life and say, Wow, I'm, this is not that impressive to me. How can this be? How, why? Well, there's a real simple reason. You don't know him. Who is the guy that was um, six foot four? That we went? Jimmy Maynard. We went to the Philippines with him. You know, he was a midget. He grew up to six foot four when he was 26 years old. If you don't know his story, it's pretty awesome. But I uh, went with him. And uh, I remember when he was teaching the Filipinos, he'd always get kind of mad. He had this big body and kind of a little smaller head. Cause, and then he had this high voice. But he would always be preaching at him. He says, the problem is you don't know God. You don't know his word. And he'd get real mad. And, uh, but I always remember that he says, you think you know his word, but you don't know his word. Because when you know his word, these things take place in your life. You know, and I thought about that, man, I, I can't understand what he's talking about. I mean, I do understand what he's talking about. You can know about God, but when you know him, when you know him, when you're close to him, when you're intimate with him, you are not jealous of anybody. You are not envious of anybody else's life. You are not thinking that you've got a poor deal. You are thrilled with what you got because you, when you know him, you know how, how much you're loved by him. When you know him, you know how much he cares for you. When you know him, you know what an awesome plan he has for you. And you know that he's not shorting you in any way, but he's giving you just the perfect thing for your life when you know him. 
And so our problem is, is a lot of times we don't know God. We got all these false gods. Boy, and, you know, and if you haven't read Codependent Christianity, I encourage you to read that book. It's just, you know, just, you know, man, you got to just kind of feed on that. But boy, if you're ever looking to somebody else to make you happy, you're a codependent Christian. And it means you're going to be discouraged. You're going to be in despair. If somebody else is, is responsible for your happiness, they have become your God. And I guarantee you they're going to be a lousy one. They're really going to let you down. You say, well, you kind of take away the whole romance of a marriage. I said, yeah, I am. But I'm telling you what, if you take the real deal, you'll love it. If you get out of the fantasy world, you're going to love the real world. Your God loves you. You know, when you really know somebody, when you really are friends with them, uh, and I don't know if this is going to equate to some of you, but... um, you know, when you really know somebody, you're not just thrilled to get on Facebook to see what they posted. When you're wanting to get to know somebody, you'll follow every article that's written about them. You'll follow every program they made or whatever else, and you'll follow all their Twitters and all that. But when you really know somebody, it's like you already know them. A lot of you, if you knew that I was on YouTube, you wouldn't be impressed at all. So why should I watch that? I get to be with him. I'm just telling you because it's some good stuff and you need to watch. No, (laughs) don't reject me. (laughs) You know, let me just say this a little bit different. You know, if if you're always reading about awesome Christians and and about uh, all the phenomenal miracles that are taking place, which are all awesome, they're just... Day by day, and you're, and, you're, and you're hearing about the new revival, or you're hearing a new wave, or you're hearing about a new outbreak, or a new, uh, a new, uh, new something, uh, you know, where God's doing this extraordinary thing. And if that really cranks your whistle all the time, you might want to check your heart. Do you really know God? Or are you still looking to meet Him? Because when I hear about somebody raising the dead, when I hear somebody about doing extraordinary things, I'm blessed. But you know something? I never feel like, oh, I need to get there. I need to go find out what's going on. When I hear of a revival breaking out and people just, extraordinary things, I go, man, that's cool. But I, I never have this urgency. I need to go check that guy out. I need to go check that book out. I need to go get that video. I need to go to those meetings. Why? Because I know God. I know God. The God that's doing all those things is my friend. I have access to him 24 hours a day. I can ask him anything, and he'll tell me. There are no mysteries. He keeps no secrets from me. He's not hotter in one place than he is hotter with me. I walk with God. Every day of my life, I walk with God. Every day of your life, you walk with your God. And every day of your life, you walk with your false gods. And that's why you want to get rid of them. But all I'm trying to say is, don't sell out cheaply what has been such a high price paid for you to have your own intimacy with the creator of the universe to where you can ask him anything and he'll tell you. He does not have any secrets from you. Now, we'll say this. There's times I know he can't get some things across to me because I haven't grown up enough to hear him. Evangelina comes and asks me how to do, uh, you know, calculus. I'm going to say, honey, you're going to have to wait. Because I don't have the capacity to explain that to you because you don't have the capacity to hear it right now. But give it time, I'll show you. And that's the same with your God. Do you know when I, when I heard that there's 200,000 home churches just under one guy? And then you add in what's happening in Burma. You add in what's happening in Africa. You add in what's happening in Europe. You add in what's happening all over America. It's like there is a lot going on. 
Don't be deceived that everybody says there's nothing. There's no revival today, you know. There are people saying, we need another revival. We need another spiritual awakening. I'm telling you, there's no spiritual awakening all in all of history that is measuring even a one iota close to what's going on in America and in the world today. It's just that we're in the middle of it so that people don't see it. But you can read about the Re- Walsh revival. You can read about... Uh, Azusa Street, you can read about all those things and you can see all those miracles, but I'm telling you, there's nothing even close to what's taking place today. Right now, today in the world is the most dynamic outpouring of the Spirit of God, the most phenomenal miracles, the most phenomenal things that are happening, both in quantity and in quality. We're in the midst of the biggest thing that God's ever done on the face of the earth. And he's invited each and every one of us to have a major part in it. The only question is, are you going to believe it? Are you going to actually trust him? Because your enemies will keep you where you're at. They'll keep you pinned down. Your fears, your insecurities, your condemnation, your feeling like you're small, feeling like you're insignificant, those are enemies. And Jesus came... So that he might deliver us from all of our enemies that we might serve him without fear. Am I saying don't get excited about those things? No, get excited about it. But get excited about this, that you know God. And you say, well, I don't know him that well. Then, But if you got introduced to him, now do the rest of the things. Spend time with him. Get committed to him. Get bonded to him. It is not for just a few special elite people. It is for every believer to have incredible intimacy with God. You know, in our world today, there's, you know, there's so, uh, there, there's a, um, what do you want to call it? But um, Steve Christensen always tells me how many people golf all over the world. It's it's incredible number of people that golf. And, uh, and then he narrows it down how many people actually can golf very well at all. And then, then it narrows down even more. And it turns out there's only about 120, I think it is, professional golfers out of all the millions of golfers. That's a pretty small, elite little group. And we get to thinking about that, that life is just like that, you know, but it's just the opposite with God. Every believer can have just as in-depth intimacy with, with, with God as any big-time preacher as, you know, you know, and sometimes even with the Chinese, you look at them and uh, you can hear about the underground church in China or Vietnam, and you can hear about their dedication, you know, and 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 it's all cool, and it really is awesome. I mean, I gotta admit, it's really, I, I met guys in Vietnam that just just came out of prison. I met met a kid, you know, in, in Vietnam. You probably heard me story. I think I put it in the uh, uh, fifty two win, but. Uh, this little guy named Joe, man, he, he, you know, he, he tried to get away from Vietnam. He, he went to a refugee camp in Hong Kong. He, he tried to hang himself. He was so discouraged because he wasn't getting out to America. And then somebody came and barely could preach the gospel. There's just, I mean, they were preaching, but there was no interpreter really. And uh, a whole bunch of them got saved. They don't even, I don't even know how. And, uh, I mean, his life flipped so dramatically. I mean, it just touched my life so bad. I was just sitting on a bus seat with him going clear out to the beach to go have a service. Uh, I was just a little discouraged that day, and, and he starts sharing with me how he just flipped his whole life around to where he's just totally in love with God, totally in love with his country again. Had an opportunity to come to America, said, no way, I'm going to go back to my people and preach the gospel. The joy in his life was, uh, you could almost be envious of it. You can almost be envious of somebody who's so focused that they've got to be focused on Christ because their whole life depends on, our, you know, uh, these Chinese, they're constantly working their text phones, they're constantly working not to get caught, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm telling you, their prisons are not nice. And yet at the same time, I'm telling you, they have nothing that you don't have. Your God absolutely is head over heels in love with you. He absolutely wants to reveal his whole self to you. He's not withholding one good thing from you. One of our struggles is we have so many things distracting us, it's hard to focus on that. 
We have so many opportunities here in America. And I know the economy is bothering all of us. I know some of the direction our country is going is bothering us. But can I just say, you know, get involved the way God tells you to get involved. But, but don't go one inch farther than what he tells you to do. You are not called to save America. You are called to preach this gospel. You are called to know God. And you think, well, what's going to happen? You know, and I got to talking to a doctor the other day. And I, some of the things that are going on right now are just, just the hair on the freaky side, man. And, uh, I mean, there's just going to be a shortage of doctors. They're getting a shortage. You know, you get a big city, you can't even get in. If you, you know, the emergency room, you may be waiting there quite a while. If you don't have the money, you, you just aren't going to be treated. You and I out here in South Dakota, we don't understand that. But then also, what, how do you think about this? They, they're doing now, and, and it's already in place where they're bringing robots into the room. And the doctor sits in his office, and the robot comes into your room. And takes a picture of you. You know, he's got it all. You know, so he's looking at you through his computer. The robot has a stethoscope so he can actually listen to your heart if he wants to. So read your chart and, and come up with your diagnosis. And you never see him. You just got this R2DQ or whatever it is. <laughs> beeping at you. Now maybe that just thrills you. But I think I got a problem with it. I want to see the guy that's going to determine my protocol, what's going to happen to me. And I sure don't want to see a, a robot come in with a knife in his palm to execute the surgery. Although, I will admit, they're using robots to do surgery right now, and they're probably better than humans. They can actually put the robots on the battlefield now and do surgeries with the doctor sitting in uh, another place in the world. That's already being done. I'm just saying there's a lot of changes. And you and I can scream and yell and freak out and, and get all upset, but it isn't going to fix anything in... Uh, Go vote, go do what you can, but don't, you've got to remember something. You were not called to change this temporal world. Jesus lived in one of the most ungodly governments that's ever been on the face of the earth, and he hardly ever mentioned it. It was not a focus. It shouldn't be our focus. Our focus is to do the work that God's called us to do, which is to tell everybody we know about this incredible God and do it without fear with full confidence that our God's going to see us through. That the God who is our source is going to see us through. And one of the first things you're going to do is you're going to look to the left or to the right, and you're going to see somebody who claimed to be a Christian or was a Christian or was a good friend of yours or a relative or something and say, What happened to them? They were believing God, and look what's happened to them. They're broke now. They're on the street now. They're, their body's got full of disease. They've got cancer. What's going to, you know, and I'm telling you, if you ever look to the left or to the right, you're going to lose your focus. If you lose your focus, you're not going to hit your target. You know, sin, the word for sin is missing the mark. And I was reading some stuff from Fred the other day really prompted this. And... Uh, And I went, dear, I hate to even say this. I got it. This is so bad. But you guys know me anyway, so who am I kidding? You know? I stand up here and think, you know, you're looking good. And then I look at the video and you go, oh, my gosh, he's got his hands in his pocket again. But you already know all that, so you've got to put up with that. But anyway, we went deer hunting once, and uh, Cliff was there, and uh, we got down the river. And uh, I walked across to this other area. And no kidding, deer just sprung up everywhere. And I took my dad's 270, and I unloaded that thing. Kaboom, boom, 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 man. It was just, man, and Cliff came running over. Man, how many did you get? <laughs> you know. <laughs> and there was nothing. <laughs> oh, there was nothing. Not, you know, there was nothing but scared deer. From the loud noise. And I'll never forget the look that he gave me. It's almost like, you know, I said, I didn't get one. He goes, oh. it's like uncomprehendable to him. But you shot seven times. 
I was expecting six dead deer. <laughs> and, I, and I still think about it now, and I go, what was I thinking? I didn't shoot to hit a deer. I just shot at the deer. I scared them, and they ran, and it made me happy. I didn't want to get one. I didn't want to kill Bambi. I just wanted to shoot. And then I thought, but I should have hit one out of pride. And I think about to this day, you know, I, am I really that bad of a shot? And I probably am, but it wasn't that I was a bad shot. I didn't shoot to kill. I didn't. I can swear to God that I just pulled a gun up and shot close to him. And that was good enough. If I hit him, great. If not, I don't have to clean anything. (laughs) You know, sin, we got such a warped perception of what sin is. It's like, sin is when you go out and do something stupid. No, sin is when you just randomly shoot. What I was doing there was sinning. I was just randomly firing my gun. I had no focus. I had no intent to kill. That's sinning. It's not when you go deliberately. I mean, it always includes it all, but it's like, man, to him who knows to do right and he doesn't do it, it's sin. To him who's been given a job to do and does not focus down on it and do it and center, you know, uh, with all of his intent to, you know, the Bible says to seek the kingdom of God, and that word seek means seek with the intent to find. Not just randomly walk in the room and say, I can't find my socks, Mom, and walk out. Isn't it amazing when the socks are on top of the drawer, and you send your kids in and say, they're in your room, and, you, you walk, and they're right there exposed. You don't even have to pull a drawer open. They're right there because they never put them in the drawer like they're supposed to. And the kid walks in, he said, Mom, I can't find him. And how many of your moms ever said, I swear to God, if I walk in there and see him, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> I'm going to poke one eye out because you aren't using it. And you walk in and there they are, broad, just right there, broad daylight. And yet, that's what sin is, folks, is when you and I just go randomly through life, firing off our shells with no focus, with no intent of hitting the mark, with no knowledge that there is a mark to hit, that God has actually got, what I shared earlier, that God actually has a place for you in the body. If you're just randomly showing up to church now and then to hear a message and then go home, I'm telling you, you're sinning. If you don't know that you've got a place to play in the body of Christ and you've got a calling on your life and you've got an invitation from God and you've got a purpose that He wants you to fulfill and that you've got to be committed to it and you've got to get with the body to do it and He's the head and all the rest of us are part of that body and you need to know your part, bring your supply and come with energy and come with focus and come and ready to kill. You're sinning! That's the willingness to continue to sin that Hebrews talks about. It's not you walking out of here and whatever you're. I won't get into any of the other ones that we normally think about. Those are immaterial. And God says, and I want you to do all this without fear. In total security. Totally feeling safe and being safe. By what? By walking in integrity. Whose integrity? His. You start walking in the fact that you start, stop looking at yourself. You stop looking at your failures. You stop looking at your abilities. You start looking at God and say, my God is perfect. My God is powerful. You know, you know here's what amazes me. How somebody said to me, you know, maybe it was one of you guys, so forgive me if I am, but just said, that the more that they study about the, the awesomeness of this world, the more they can't hardly believe it that God put it together. And I go, 
What? Then who did put it together? You know, when you start studying about the intricacy right now, they got a, a telescope in, in uh, South, uh, uh, South, South Pole. Uh, anybody read on that? They've dug through the ice. It's taken them five years because it's so stinking cold down there to work. They can only work about three months, but they got this telescope that is buried in the ice with all these sensors. Um, I think a couple miles deep. All this ice on top of it. You know, what a major project. Huge project. All for studying what? Anybody know? No, not penguins. <laughs> nice try. That's weird. <laughs> this thing can see out. I don't know if it's going to see out in outer space. I couldn't really understand all of it. But it's back to one of my favorite little subjects, neutrinos. How many of you have ever heard of neutrinos? What are neutrinos? We don't know what neutrinos are. We think they exist, but we've never seen them. And if you watch Star Wars, you'll hear them talking about it all the time. We had a uh, big, the neutrinos are, you know, up in numbers or whatever else. Because it comes from fusion. It comes from the sun. comes from atomic bombs. There's so many of them right now. If you hold, hold out your hand. Now don't freak out on me. Okay, you guys, about a square inch right in the palm of your hand. Right now, millions of neutrinos are going through there. Every second. Millions! Ooh. Miss me. They're so small, they go right through. They go right through the whole earth. They just keep on going out of space and we're trying. And we spend, literally, there's a, there's a, a, a laboratory in, in Homestake, you know. Or, well, now they're developing it, but actually it's been there for years. Down 5,000 feet, I got to go down there. Somebody wanted to pray down there. I think they thought we were closer to the devil and could get more done. I don't know why they thought we ought to pray down there, but they, I, I went not to pray, I went to go see the laboratory. But they invited a bunch of our pastors years ago, so I got to go down 5,000 feet in the homestake, and there's this great big tank about the size of this room in there, you know, with hydrochloric kind of fluid in there or whatever else, and they were just trying to, the neutrinos they thought were going through, and they had all these little computers around it for years and years monitoring. It produces a little bit of argon gas, which they would capsulize it and take it to a lead vault, you know, and, and then study the whole thing. And, and they had all these, and I go, and I was talking to them all about it, and I go, da 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 and I said, yeah, well, what do we really know? Nothing. Uh, you know, they're, they're going, well, what do we got for that? No, nothing. And, you know, and I said, well, well who's going to, what, what's going to happen here? So, uh, somebody's going to dedicate their life and study this information for, for most of their life to see if they can figure out anything. <laughs> and I go, that's scary. I said, that is insanity. And if you ever feel like your life doesn't have a purpose, think about that guy. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to sit and look at information that he doesn't even know what he's looking at, hoping they can maybe figure out something and tell him something about the materials that they're not sure they really exist. That, and now we're going to build a bigger telescope so we can find them. And it's all cool. But you know, some of your purpose is way more important. You have the ability to tell people the good news about God and change their eternal destiny forever and ever. And you look at yourself sometimes and say, who am I? I'll tell you who you are. One of the most important people on the earth today in one of the, the greatest revivals and a heart awakening times that's ever been on the face of the earth with some of the most important messages. The message that you guys have been exposed to, the message that I've is almost unheard of. There's a lot of Christianity out there, but the, the message that you guys are hearing about faith, grace, and, and, and all these things that we teach is almost nil. How much do you respect it? How sharp is your gun? I mean, what's your aim like? You say, well, pastor, it makes sense to me, but I don't know what to do. Then find out. Sell out your life to find out. Make a commitment. Don't just show up randomly and wonder if it's going to hit smack you because you could be right in the middle of it and never know it. 
The only question really is, are you going to believe? That's the only real question. Are you going to believe? Hallelujah. What fun. What fun. Do you realize what fun we get to have? You realize what we're hearing today? That billions of people will never have a chance to hear, that would give, give everything to hear? And we're not even being shot at. We're not even being persecuted. We got all the freedom in the world. And just like me, when I ran across that hill and just started, boom, gosh, it was fun. Man, one deer jumped straight up out of it, you know, said, man, that was close. <laughs> I had to be within a foot. <laughs> gosh, I don't know why, but the Holy Ghost has been bringing that all week to me and just been embarrassed as heck. Kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. What'd you get, John? Uh, was I supposed to say something? Gosh. It was just fun to make noise. We're called to do a lot more make noise, aren't we? I can't convince you. I can't. I can only lead you to the pasture that you can eat. God has an incredible plan for your life. Hallelujah. Father God, I thank you for today. And I, it's just, God, it just seems like it's a long shot to me. It, it, it seems like it's a Hail Mary of anybody re- in this room really believing this. And yet, each person in here has not only the right, but the responsibility to believe this. It's not out of our reach. It's not far out. It's not in outer space. It's not deep in the earth. It's right here, right now, your truth that we are now the children of God. Created in your image. Totally washed clean. Totally empowered by your spirit. The the creator of all the universe lives inside of us. And has a plan and a purpose and a work for us to do. God, it seems like a long shot to me that anybody in here is going to believe that, including me. At the same time, wow, God, what if somebody does? What if somebody does? What if one of these young people right here listen to me or somebody listen to this message on the internet What if somebody actually believes the truth? That they can live out the rest of their life without any anxiety, without any fear, without any worries, because they know the living God, the provider of all things that they need. And He has promised that He will never, ever forsake them or leave them or abandon them or not empower them to win over every enemy that would come to them. What if somebody believes that? And I know, Father, perhaps I should be a real bold and brass and say, we're all going to believe it. But, Father, you know something? I don't know. But I do know this. John Williamson is tired of just shooting at or near a target. I want to focus down, and I want to hit the mark. And I believe there's many in here today praying the same prayer. So help us, God. Help us, God. We love you. We love you.